Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here's the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Pedosa, the Land Geek, with your favorite website, niche real estate land site, www.thelandgeek.com. And today is a little different. My guest is a full-time real estate investor and part-time adventure taker. He is a wholesaler and flipper and currently daydreams of landlording and developing. He has completed just under 100 wholesale deals in his career and with a partner does 15 to 20 fix and flips a year. My guest, Anson Young, lives in beautiful Colorado with his wife and son. And he plays in a band and is way too in to cold showers. Anson Young, how are you? I'm good, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. All right, so before we get into how you developed uh, your success strategies, um, Let's talk about these cold showers. What's going on with these things? <laughs> well, it's uh, it, kind of like one of those things where you come across the same thing over and over. I kept coming across, uh, no matter who it was online, was, was everybody talking about morning routine, morning routine, morning routine, whether it was Tim Ferriss or uh, somebody else. It just kept coming up and coming up. And so the more I was looking into it, the more I was like, okay, I need to structure the first uh, 60 minutes of my day or hour and a half, something like that. And um, one of the things was jump straight, you know, wake up, jump straight into the cold shower, and you won't, it basically just just lights you on fire to get the rest of your day going because you're, you're fully awake. You have to be. It's just ice cold water on you. Right. And you, and you get out of the shower and you're just ready to destroy the rest of your day. You're just, you're so amped up that you can't help but to, you just start taking action. You're not going to lazily sit in bed for the whole morning. You're going to jump right up, right into that cold shower, and, and, and boom, you're ready to go. Okay, so, so this it, is not a lukewarm shower. Like I'm a little cold. This no, is a no, cold Colorado shower. Yeah. How long does it take? I mean, is it miserable? Is it two minutes of misery? It's At first, it is. When you first start doing it, it's brutal. Okay. But But honestly, after about a week, you're so used to it. That it's it's it, it's almost like a normal shower. It sounds weird, but it definitely it just lights your system up. It just your your body reacts to it in such a way that you're that you're just you're just you're so ready to go to go do your next thing. You know, whereas if you sit in bed for an hour and you're reading Facebook and then you take this nice thirty minute hot shower, you're just kind of like, oh, I'm relaxed, I'm ready to go, I'm so, you know, I'm so laid back. And then, but if you just jump right out of bed straight into a cold shower, the rest of your day will will be amazing. I, I almost wow. guarantee it. All right, now, so, now this, this, is, this is what I do. I, I wake up um, pretty early, like 5.30, 5.45. Okay. And the first thing I do is, you know, brush my teeth, okay. take my vitamins, okay. and then I do, like, the 7-minute or 14-minute workout, which okay. is, like, no resting. Like, nice. boom, 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 and I'm going to sweat, and then I go shower. Nice, yeah. Okay, now you're telling me after that workout I should – I should take a cold shower. You should. Yeah, I think even, even though my heart's beating fast and I'm sweating. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You'll 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 feel great. I I just say try it for like a week. Okay. And I I think it came I think it came across uh, the first I read about it was like a TEDx talk right. and the guys like you know extolling the virtues of of the cold shower and so I said you know what I'm going to try it and then I tried it and you know I I'll I'll slip every now and then where I'm just like eh, I just want a warm shower but most days where I'm or I need to be working all day and I need to just jump right out and get started with action, I'll just start off with, you know, a brutally cold shower and then the rest of my day is, is great. Okay. It's no. weird. It's weird. It sounds weird, but it's Yeah, it but the answer, are you gonna get clean? Don't you need the hot water to kill like the bacteria? Nah, I don't think so. You know that's what soap that's what soap's for, I guess. I don't know. All right, all right. <laughs> all right, well you know what? That's a great productivity tip. Hey. To be, yeah, exactly. to be ultra productive, get you know, jump in that cold shower. Yeah. All right. So when did you start doing uh, fix and flips and wholesaling. And now, let me get this straight. Is there a difference between fix and flips there, and wholesaling? Yeah, there's definitely a difference. So okay. wholesale is 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 the quick flip. You don't generally do any repairs to it. 
you'll sell it to most likely another investor. So you get a you get a deal under contract, sell it to another investor for a, a markup price. Okay. So if I get something under contract for fifty grand, I'll sell it to you for sixty. You're going to turn around and you you're either going to rent it out that the numbers make sense to you, or you're going to fix and flip it yourself. Okay. Um, whereas a fix and flip, obviously, I'm I'm taking title to the property. I'm doing all the repairs to it, and then I'm turning around and selling it to uh, usually a first-time home buyer or a, you know a more of like a conventional FHA type buyer. So I'm not selling to an investor, selling to an end user. Okay. So um, and when I got started in that was around 2004, 2005. Um, good good I, time to get started, but then pretty, pretty rough. <laughs> it, it, it was. We were in. Um, we moved from Colorado to Phoenix for a couple of years. We decided to just make a change, and um, on the way down there, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, which got me uh, not wanting to go back to a corporate job, of course. Right. And so I just I just started doing some uh, small jobs for some agents and investors, and and just trying to plug into the network down there in Arizona. And then in Arizona, it was double digit appreciation. It was like forty four percent, something totally unsustainable, but. It was like a rocket ship, and uh, pretty much and everybody and their mom was talking about getting into real estate. It was like the, your hairdresser and the lady at the grocery store, and everybody's mind was on real estate. And so I lucked into right. a deal that we ended up um, – <clears throat> I didn't know what I was doing, of course. So we tried to lease option it, which is get a tenant buyer in there. He would have an option to buy it in a year or two. And, of course, I didn't know what I was doing, but it all worked out. We moved into it for a year. We sold it. At the end of 2005, right when the market cooled off, right. um, we made a good chunk of change and we moved back to Denver. And uh, I got my agent license here. And ever since, I've been doing uh, either involved with in fix and flips or wholesaling ever since. So okay, and you do 15 to 20 deals a year in just fix and flips. Right. So that's that's over one a month. That is. Okay, so you're busy. Pretty busy. Try to stay busy. Absolutely. All right. So, how does how do you create this system to be able to do that kind of volume? Because well, the fix and flip world is very competitive, correct? It is. It, it's competitive. It's it's it can be very time consuming. Um, I do have a partner that I work with, and and then I'll you know he'll do deals on his own. We'll partner up on deals, and then I'll do deals on my own. It just depends on what area of town or what we all have going on at that time, but um, that partnership helps because he can take on some, you know, some responsibility. If it's something in his area of town, he can go make sure that materials were delivered, make sure that our uh, contractors are showing up, those kind of things. So I think that's how we stay sane is, is kind of share the load, so to speak. Right. If I had to do it all myself, it would, it would get a bit crazy, but um, we definitely did test the limits of our systems uh, last September when we had about we bought nine properties in September, and it was more than two people can handle. But we definitely stretched and learned and learned what our capacity is, what our money lender capacity is, what our uh, crews, our, our contractors' capacity was for work, and um, so that was a good learning experience. We didn't lose any money on anything, but it was definitely a lot, lot, lot of work. But uh, we, we try to share the load on on all the different flipping areas, acquisitions, on you know managing the rehabs, managing the sales, and you know managing the private money. So sure. we, we try to share the load there. So that's awesome. Okay, so yeah. which do you prefer then, wholesaling or fix and flipping? I I actually prefer fix and flipping because it's you get to see that end product and you get to be involved in all the design steps along the way it's really nice to take this piece of junk house turn it around to something nice and, and you get to see you know through the whole process the family that's going to move into it and how that they'll have a, a nice uh, product that doesn't need any deferred maintenance right. and uh, and I learned that on pretty early on my, my second deal was a single mom with three kids and she was so proud to have this house where nothing no work needed to be done and she could show it off to her friends and family and it was all hers and she was so excited to finally get into you know something that was of quality and and nothing needed to be done and that that process taking it from what it was all the way to the end product is is I like that a lot so um, I prefer that the wholesaling is nice because it's a quicker payday um, 
you know, it's usually a 15 to 30 day window of, of uh, when I have it under contract and when I sell it, sometimes less, sometimes even a week. But, you know, then they take that project and they do whatever they want with it, which is great. You know, the paycheck's great, but it, you don't get that other fulfilling piece of, you know, seeing what happens to the end product and, you know, watching somebody move into it and that's their home and they're proud of it. And you, you're the one that made all the decisions that go into it. So, right. that, yeah. Right. Now, what do, what do you think you learned mo mostly from as far as when you first got into it? Do you think you learned mostly from your mistakes or from your successes or a blend? I mean, do you have any kind of mentor that you go to and you say, okay, I'm looking at this deal and how would you structure it? That kind of thing. No, I've definitely learned, I think, more from mistakes. Um, the successes are always nice, but um, I feel like you learn more when you fall down, you get back up. I've definitely had uh, mentors and people in my life who have uh, helped me along, whether it's a formal relationship or whether it's you know friends who I've met through networking and they're also in real estate. I. I'd like to think that I've picked up enough, a lot of people along the way where they can bounce ideas off of me, I can bounce ideas off of them. Um, but definitely starting out, I had you know one or two investors slash agents who helped me along through, you know, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, what do I do in this situation? And then they would you know lend their expertise. And then even moving back here to Denver, I had kind of the same relationship with one or two people where it was like doing that first hump from zero deals to one deal, you know, that's a huge step and a lot of people fall off that cliff, but if you have help there to to kind of guide you, um, I don't know how else you do it without making a ton of mistakes. I've definitely made mistakes, but sure. mentors mentors kind of cut that down. Yeah, so. yeah, that, 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 absolutely. So, um, okay, so walk me through an Anson Young day because Clearly, there's got to be some type of efficiencies in there and some kind of productivity hack that allows you to do such a volume of deals. Because sure. this is hard work. It, it, it can be. Yeah. Um, I definitely, you know, starting off, I've de you know, disclaimer, so to speak, I definitely work my business around my life <clears throat> and not the other way around. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to create more of a lifestyle business where, you know, I have a young son. I'm obviously married. Um, I try to um, keep those things at the forefront. So I'll, I'll kind of walk you through, <clears throat> I guess, a, a typical day. But um, try to wake up around 6, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. I'll, I'll definitely jump right out of bed, go into the cold shower most days, um, try to keep that routine going. And then after that, I'll do... Um, uh, every day I, I write in my uh, kind of my planner. Um, okay. I'm, I'm kind of t tweaking it for 2015, but it, it it definitely spells out. Now you're you know, handwriting it, or are you using a, a notebook, I, or I'm I'm handwriting it right now. Okay. And then I'm uh, it's an Evernote notebook. So Evernote.com is a great. Um, it's kind of just uh, all. You kind of your life online. It's you know journaling. It's uh, I put my blog posts up there. I put everything up there that I need that I can access from any device. So this Evernote notebook helps that I can write it down in person, which I think is important. I think it's that tactile um, pen to paper kind of thing. Sure. And so so you're planning out your day. I, I plan out. I try to plan out every single you know uh, time block of okay this is what I want to get done this is what I want to get done this is what I want to get done right. you know, now, now do you prioritize it do you put it in buckets like I read a book um, a few months ago and he says okay you know think about the the most important things in your life that you want to accomplish for that year so right. you know for me it like might be you know for family um, business um, uh, and let's say, uh, you know, just my well-being, right? Sure. Um, and then I'll look at my day and I'll, I'll put in those three buckets, okay, these are the most important things I need to get done to fill up those buckets. Right. Did I think that was, uh, that? was that Eat That Frog? Was that the book? No, that's <laughs> Brian Tracy. I did read that as well. This was, uh, I want to say Pressman, maybe? Okay. Um, yeah, and and I definitely try to try to tackle them in priority of of you know what's the most important thing I need to get done today. I'm going to try get try to get that done first. 
So then I, I'm not procrastinating and pushing it off. It might be something that I don't want to do, like a phone call I don't want to make or a, a visit to a job site that I really don't want to do to because I have to, you know, fire somebody or something. Right, that doesn't right. happen but, very often. Oh yeah, but. I just found the book. It's 18 Minutes by Peter Bregman. What was that? 18 Minutes by Peter Bregman. 18 minutes. Okay, yeah. nice. But, okay, I, I, I think it's kind of a similar philosophy where it's that that number one thing that you need to get done, do it first, because then the rest of your day is 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 uh, is on easy mode. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. You got you got it out of the way. You're like, okay, now I'm done with it. But definitely try to get that um, get that list so I know what I'm working with for the day. And obviously things come up and things change, but that that's kind of my roadmap for the day. Right. Um, and then in there I write down my my kind of uh, overall goals. So every day I'm like writing it down. It's it, I'm not just reading it. I'm actually writing it down, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> then after that. Um, you know, I kind of launch into my day. My son's awake. You know, we'll uh, I'll get him breakfast. We'll watch cartoons. You know, we'll hang out a bit. Um, usually, if he has to go to school, which is around nine o'clock, I'll I'm, I'm, I'm almost always taking him to school. So <clears throat> that's important to me um, to be part of that part of his day. Take him to school, and then right after that, nine thirty is when I kind of launch into my day. I work from right now a home office. Uh, and so, you know, I basically just come back home. I start into, you know, whatever I need to get done by, by priority. So I'm making calls. I'm checking emails. I'm, I try not to check my email before that time. I don't want to like get that all jumbled up. And the whole time I'm with my family, I'm like thinking about all this stuff. I have to, you know, all these emails that are pressing on me. So I try to get that done after, you know, when, when my day actually starts for work right. and, uh, and get, try, start to get that done. So Emails, calls, all that fun stuff. Um, a lot of our, a lot of my day is spent with either acquisitions or on kind of managing rehab pieces. So, acquisitions is is you know whatever we're trying to get done that day. If it's a mailing campaign, if it's uh, MLS offers, if it's uh, networking, you know, taking a lunch with a short sale agent, you know, sure. something that kind of fuels that acquisition side of the business. And then in the afternoon, um, if I need to go out to job sites, I'll, I'll block that between three and five to get that uh, done. And every every single Friday, I'm running checks. So our guys get paid weekly. So I'm running checks every Friday. So I always have that blocked out in the afternoon. Um, so it's kind of, I mean, it, 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 it does morph from day to day, but I try to keep... Uh, things as as regimented as possible so that I am keeping on task and I'm not just um, dorking around half the day and you know I need I need something that's that's more structured so I try to keep my day that way so yeah I mean I, I hate when I have a day and, and it always happens if I look back on my day and I try to actually before I end my day um, before I go to bed I'll actually write out what I got done. Yeah, absolutely. And then I'll plan my day for the next day. And then, yeah. But the days that I look back and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what an unproductive day. It's always, inevitably, because I got anxious and I checked my email early. Sure. And I got sucked into the email vortex and I was reacting all day long. Sure. Reacting, reacting, reacting. And I never got accomplished the main goal of that day, or the, you know, usually I try to have two or three big things that I want to get done for the day, right? Um, within you know, deal flow and marketing, and uh, and selling, right? Right. Um, do you ever have that happen where you know you just have a day kind of lost? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think if left to my own devices, and I didn't have you know structure and people kind of depending on me to do stuff for them, I would probably do the same where I just, you know, go off in a lot of land and surf Facebook all day or something. But <laughs> um, <laughs> not that I try to do that. But if, if I ever feel like I'm not um, on task or I'm kind of uh, just kind of out there and not focusing on what I need to focus on, um, I have a, uh, a plug-in to my browser called Stay Focused that will block um, sites that I tell it to. Uh -huh. and, there's, and there's no way around it without... And I gave the, the actual password to my wife. So if, if ever I'm like, hey, I need that password, she knows that I'm maybe, you know, uh, on Facebook or something too much. And even though there's networking and I've, and I've 
you know, or bigger pockets or something like that. Stay focused lets me block everything that's not important. And then so I basically have to stay on task. But I've, I've definitely had days like that. And it, you know, you get to the end and you're like, hmm, I didn't really get that much done or I didn't do anything today. And it's always a, a, a bad feeling. <laughs> it's right, like, uh, right. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. So as far as fixing and flipping and wholesaling, since this is a land podcast, have you sure, ever sure. thought about investing in raw land? And if you haven't, like, why not? Like, what? Okay. You, because it's, you know, it's definitely not a thing that most people think about. It's definitely on the fringes, right? Right. No, I, maybe not the fringes. I mean, what came first? I mean, no, right. somebody, yeah. so somebody came across raw land and then they're like, hey, I'm going to build a uh, subdivision here or, you know, go through that process. Um, I think for me, um, I've taken kind of the two easier routes you know, looking from the top down, wholesaling, I don't ever have to take title to a property. I can just sell it on to the next guy. Um, and then fix and flip is kind of one step beyond that. Once I can find deals, now I can fix them up myself and, and sell them on, you know, and then you start getting deeper down the rabbit hole, which would be, you know, once you're fixing and flipping, then what are you looking at? You're looking at maybe scrape or redevelopment. Um, right. So you're doing some infill development. Maybe you're taking uh, uh, in an area where cost per square foot to build is cheaper than you know to buy. So then you're then you're uh, scraping houses and rebuilding them, and then deeper down that rabbit hole it would be actual development. So then you would be finding raw land. So to me, raw land ties in with development. Maybe that's a roadblock in my own brain, um, but I've always. I've always associated the two and it's kind of, you know, the furthest down the rabbit hole would be, you know, find enough raw land to do a subdivision or a commercial or something like that. So I think that that's my mental roadblock is that I'm maybe just not there yet or ready for that. I'm kind of dipping my toes into redevelopment, um, in 2015 is, is the goal. And so, uh, cause it kind of takes that whole process of taking something that's, you know, not there and then fixing it to something nice um, to another level where I can take a, you know, house and build a brand new one on it, you know, kind of thing. Right. But all the, to me, all it, I guess it's just a barrier of knowledge. I don't know a lot about, you know, zoning, rezoning, bringing in utilities, all those things. But right. well, now what you're now what you're discussing is very complex. When you, okay. if you're going to, if you're going to take a, a piece of raw land right. and go vertical on it, yeah, you're probably talking about one of the most more complex real estate transactions there are. Sure, if I not, think that's where my brain that that's where the roadblock is because yeah, you're, yeah. now you're going to tell me something that's so blow my, my mind, niche. So. I don't go into that, right? Eighty percent of developers go under, <clears throat> and okay. so it's you know very high <sighs> risk. Of course, there's very high reward as well, right. but extremely high risk. Um, just most development projects they've run out of money. Um, and there's costly mistakes along the way. So sure. what my niche is we look for people that are distressed, right? So sure. they owe back taxes on a piece of raw land, right? So sure. then we send them a low ball offer on that piece of land, which they most likely are not emotionally attached to. They've, they've never done anything on it. They may have had it for a generation or two. Sure. They don't care. They're t it's now become a liability. It's no sure. longer an asset. So they sell it to us, and then we go ahead and very quickly, within 30 to 60 days, either flip it for cash for over a 300% return, or okay. we put a note on it. We do owner financing on easy terms, like a car payment, and it's a one-time sale, recurring passive income, and the best thing about it is no rodents, no renovations, no renters. Sure. I yeah. can see that. And um, so that's my niche. And, uh, but it's interesting because I think most fix and flippers and most wholesalers, most traditional real estate people, they don't discuss this at all. Because right. when you think about raw land, they think, you know, Donald Trump. Let's, let's go vertical on this. Let's do infill development. Let's create something physical on that piece of raw land because... Well, that's what people do, and that's yeah, that's how my niche is different. Yeah, no, that's uh, I I guess I've never considered it like that before. Living in, you know, 
living in the city, obviously, right. <laughs> there's, there's, there's just not a lot of raw land, and what there is either has you know utilities brought to it for a development that went under, and now we're trying to make something out of it, or like you said, a reef, uh, an infill de- redevelopment type project. Right. That's what you know. That's what I think of when I when I think raw land, and like I said, that, that's definitely a roadblock because that's what you just said makes very simple, um, very simple sense. I mean. How can you get more simple than that? It's taking right. a distressed owner and, and, and making something out of what they don't want anymore, I guess. Right, right. So, and now, <clears throat> now, now I'm really going to convince you when we get off the podcast to look deeper into it because we don't have any Dodd-Frank issues. We're exempt okay. because it's raw land. There's no tenant. So okay. we're, we're Dodd-Frank exempt and we're RESPA exempt. Wow, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So Interesting. Yeah. Who is usually, I'm going to ask you a question, who is usually the... You know, you, you said the structure and note type uh, buyer. Um, right. Who is usually that buyer? Somebody who wants to maybe go put a trailer on it? I mean, what, who yeah, is that so, normal person? So I guess? That normal person is somebody that wants to buy a piece of land because they've grown up with the concept sure. that land goes up in value eventually, or it's the only thing that lasts. So they know okay, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to hold this, I don't have to do any kind of maintaining on it, there's nothing to protect, the taxes are, are property taxes are relatively low, and you've got this nice niche of people, let's call them preppers, survivalists, military people, sure. people that want to you know, use it recreationally, somebody that may eventually want to build on it, and it's an affordable piece of real estate that they can really are only typically limited only by their imagination, okay. or the people planning and zoning. That's it. Is, is that the same for when you're quick flipping the land in thirty to sixty days? It's kind of the same type same, of same buyers. Way. Absolutely. So those buyers have cash, and the other ones, um, you know, it might be a forty-acre parcel, and the only way they're going to be able to afford it is if we do easy terms. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Where do you advertise those those types of deals? So we go where the where the buyers are, and there's you know websites like landandfarm.com and landflip.com and okay. landwatch.com that specialize just in land. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So we have a nice yeah. we have a nice niche. All right. Well, we're at that point now in the podcast that I love, especially for the new guests because they get to put you on the spot. And you probably aren't going to sweat because you take cold showers. But uh, <laughs> what is your tip of the week that our uh, listeners can take advantage of right now? So my tip of the week deals with um, basically kind of how we've automated a lot of the, the different little pieces of our business right? and how, how we can kind of run uh, – parts of our business just from a phone or an iPad kind of thing uh, on the go. And so <clears throat> I'm just going to throw a couple apps out there that we use on a daily basis. And these aren't just, you know, um, apps for your phone, but they tie into uh, online websites, those kind of things. So basically the first one that I love is it's called IF. TTT. It's if this, then that. I love that site. <laughs> I love it. And, and so I, I have it on my phone. I have it on my iPod, on my iPad, and I have it on um, my uh, my Chrome, which is what I use for for internet. Yeah. And so it's basically if this, then that. It's that simple. You can tie in if I'm taking pictures out at a piece of land, and I want it to then go into my Dropbox automatically. Boom! I tie those two apps together, and that's what happens. If I want to, um, if I meet a new person and I've entered them into my contacts on my phone, boom! It's going to either I can have it email me, I can put it into a Google spreadsheet. It'll automatically uh, email that person and say, "Hey, it was great meeting you. Here's my contact information back." Um, those that kind of thing. So a, a million different little things like that sure. um, that kind of help. Automate little little pieces of your business to, to to help you run a little bit more efficiently. I like it because you can just use it on the go, and it automatically just does stuff once you create the recipes in there. Um, another one, obviously, something like Dropbox, something that's online where you can place files, um, you can share those things, um, you can sh- you know share PDFs, you can share stuff with your partners, automatically put stuff up there that uh, that a resource that. 
you know, that if you and your team use or just you, if you just want a place to have it if your house burns down and you don't have your computer anymore, all, you know, a lot of your important files are still out there and protected. Um, I use a lot of um, remote uh, signing, like online signing sure, type stuff. Sure. Um, one that I use is DocuSign Inc. I love Doc DocuSign. DocuSign's good, but I did yeah. recently find a new one called Dot Loop. And uh, since oh. I am a real estate agent, it's a good way to keep um, keep my uh, real estate files up there too. I can kind of just create you know a property transaction, and then inside of there, I can just upload the PDF contracts. I can actually take those contracts and just send them out for signature um, to somebody else. They can sign online. It'll obviously let me know. Um, it seems like DocuSign is more of a you know here's this document. I want to get it signed. Right. Dot loop. Dot loop is more of hey here's all the all of the pieces of this transaction, all the all the uh, disclosures that I need, all the contracts, all of all of that, and then I can also just take pieces of those and get them off for signature, which is great. Um, <clears throat> so that's another one that I like. Maybe I have one more. Oh, always Evernote. I'm always pimping out Evernote. It's such a good, uh, it's just such a great software for kind of all of your um, all of your online thoughts and writing and and. And you can upload PDFs, and so if you're writing a book or if you're doing deals, you can just kind of put everything that you want up there. And I tie it in with a notebook, so I can take a picture of a page if I'm taking notes in person at a at a seminar, or just today if I'm if I'm writing down um, you know websites that you're talking about. Then I can just take a picture of that. It goes straight into my Evernote, and and it'll it can be searched by um, the text. So if I write down landflips.com. And then I'm going. I'm in my Evernote. I'm like, ah, I don't have my notebook with me. What was Mark talking about? Right. Boom! I can search for it. And you know, even though I wrote it down, I can now search for it in an online format, which is sweet. So I love it. I love <clears> it. <throat> All right. So my tip of the week is going to be learn more about Anson. Go to biggerpockets.com/slash/users/slash/Anson. I'll have a link to that. And certainly connect with Anson um, and network. Why not? Right? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Um, and then we were just talking about this before the podcast. We're big Seth Godin fans. Absolutely. And, uh, Seth Godin's like a, how would you describe him? Like a marketing teacher, a marketing. Uh, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's like a marketing guru in the sense of like old school gurus. Like he'll, he'll impart, you know, one paragraph of knowledge that you can apply immediately to. Uh, pretty much anything that you're doing. So I like that that piece of it where it's it doesn't have to be long winded. You can just take that you know two or three sentence thing or a paragraph long thing, and it's usually very profound, and you can apply it immediately to what you're trying to do, or it gets you to think differently about your business or your marketing or your life or just little things like that. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, and he's you know, he's inspirational. Uh, but I think you you hit the the nail on the head when you said he makes you think about things in a different way, and he challenges you to go outside your comfort zone every day, make a ruckus. There's never been a better time in history where you can be your own brand, and as long as you have the courage and the you know I guess just balls to go out there and 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 you know have your point of view and and do it i mean you know the the barrier to entry now is nothing i think the big challenge is if everyone's their own brand how do you differentiate yourself and how do you create value right and that's where he kind of comes in and challenges you um, absolutely i think pur purple cow was a good example of that where it's your you're, you know, if you're on the forefront, the cutting edge of whatever you're trying to do, you're going to be that purple cow, and then pretty soon everybody's going to follow along and try to emulate what you're doing because what you started off with was so different that you got a lot of attention, and uh, in in your brand or your marketplace or whatever your business is, and then you go find your, a new purple cow, and you and you keep, you know, the first time you see a purple cow, you're like, wow, it's a purple cow, but hundred times you see a purple cow, you're like, oh, there, you know, I've seen that a hundred times, you know. Right. So, so that 
differentiate yourself in the brand, which is exactly what you just said, which is awesome, which is why I like it so much. Yeah, yeah. So his new book, it's going to be it's going to be different. He's, <laughs> he's actually creating his own purple cow of a book. It's going to be uh, yourturn.link, www.yourturn.link. And uh, yeah. check it out. He's going to make it like a magazine kind of book. It's it's very cool. So um, anyways, listen, uh, I want to thank everybody for taking time out today to listen to the podcast. Give us some love. Let us know how we're doing with the podcast. Leave a, a review on iTunes. And, uh, you know, certainly do that. And if you want to learn more about uh, The Land Geek, go to www.thelandgeek.com and download for free the Passive Income Blueprint. Anson, you can do the same thing. Uh, I'm going to, yeah. actually. Get, so get the Passive Income Blueprint, get the ebook, How to Avoid the Three Fatal Land Buying Mistakes, and of course, get this informative and engaging podcast delivered each week to your email inbox. Anson Young, are we good? We are great. I appreciate you breaking down the vacant land. Um, and like you said, nobody talks about it. Right. But now that we've talked about it, it it's, it's made me very intrigued because uh, it, it is a very niche thing, but Man, I uh, I learned a lot for sure. Just in that small piece, it it's uh, definitely changed my view on raw land for sure. Well, great, great. Well, listen, I want to wish you continued success with all your fix and flips and your wholesale deals, and I'm sure I'll be following your uh, success on bigger pockets uh, as everyone else's. And um, you know, I'm I'm probably going to email you tomorrow, and it's probably going to be a lot of expletives, ending with. Why did I take that cold shower answer? <laughs> but I'm going to do it, and I'm going to come back to you, and uh, and see how you know if it's a if it's great productivity hack. I I think it will be. Just you hack it out for a week, and you'll I think you'll uh, you'll, you'll be a changed man for sure. Two, all right, I'll give it a week. <laughs> and uh, now I'm not going to have a heart attack or anything, am I? Well, there's always a risk of that, but right. but uh, that's okay. All right, all right, so so take the risk. Take the risk. It's worth the risk. All right. In the, in the name of productivity, <laughs> I'll take the risk. I like it. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks a lot, uh, again. Thanks, everybody, again for listening, and we'll see everyone next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.